Sure. So the next step is prepare for a CMMC assessment. So we got all, all the way up to, let's go ahead and prepare so we can successfully pass, which is step seven, the assessment. So Joy, I'll let you take control. Excellent. So we have 12 weeks down for step six and the documentation part of this. And honestly, hopefully you've been documenting all along as you've been going and improving your environment, identifying what assets you have, classifying them in the right um, scoping areas. When we start with the most important document of all is the SSP. And this document, the SSP, is going to list not just the 110 controls, but the assessment objectives associated with each of those controls. And you have to identify for each of these assessment objectives how you are answering to the necessary implementation for each of those asset categories. So you can't just repeat the capability. You can't just say on the SSP for one of those practices, yes, we identify our CUI assets. You have to say how. What kind of process are you using to identify those assets? And then importantly, what about the assets through different systems? You can't just say users, for example. You have to understand what types of processes are acting on behalf of users, how you're going through that identification process. This is a very detailed exercise. If your SSP is 50 pages, I'm going to guess that you have not put a lot of time into it and it won't have the level of detail required for an assessor to look at it and feel confident that you have a mature process in documenting your security controls. So the SSP at the highest level is going to be one of the biggest things that's an indicator Red light, green light, are you mature in how you're handling your documentation, okay? So you're incorporating those assessment objectives into the SSP. Let's look at the next thing here is the network diagram. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about this when we get into step seven and you actually are engaging with the C3PAO for your assessment, but you will want to have really good diagram showing the makeup of your network. It was a great dem demonstration and visual that you shared with us, Daniel, um, for all of the different areas where the assets are in the organization. You need something similar called a network diagram, an infrastructure map, if you will, for all of those assets that's going to incorporate things like the MSP, right? Not just things within your own building, but any external services. Um, and then you don't have to have a data flow diagram. I would strongly encourage the exercise being done so that as we were saying, you know, a lot of organizations don't even know where the CUI is flowing and, and where the data is resting. But if you have a data flow diagram that you've gone through the exercise of creating, that's going to be really helpful in defending your scope. The next item on the list is that inventory list. Um, not only identifying those assets that are part of the CMMC level two scope, with all the different classifications, but calling out those things that you are choosing not to include in scope. That will help you to answer questions when you're defending the scope, all right? The next part of the documentation is going to be the self-assessment report that you have completed with the corresponding score that you've uploaded into the SPRS system. And each time that you've gone through the self-assessment process, you're likely going to be identifying things that you still need to improve upon, if not completely remediate before you have your actual assessment performed. Those items go on what's called a POAM, the plan of action and milestones. You want to have all of those POEM items checked off. Now, there's a couple exceptions. We'll talk about that when we get to the next step here of engaging with the C3PAO. And the next thing for documentation are the organizational responsibilities. So as you go through in the policies, for example, to identify how you are addressing the access to the network and you're saying who's responsible for what, Oftentimes, that may be somebody on your own team internally, or it could be an external service provider that is performing that capability. So for each of those practices, perhaps even down to the assessment objective level, with that shared responsibility matrix, you want to know who's responsible for which of those capabilities. 
And then finally, the FIPS validation. And this is interesting because when DIPCAC was talking recently in a town hall about what were some of the most common controls that organizations are failing, the FIPS validation was one of the ones that kept recurring. FIPS validated components may or may not be showing up on the FIPS marketplace or website where you can pull up specific components to see what um, if they are validated at 140-2, but you actually have to have proof of that. So any of the systems or components that require FIPS 140-2 validation, you want to make sure that you have the URL and the screenshot that links directly back to show that you are proving implementation of the correct level of encryption. So Joy, I have a follow-up question to that. And I sure. get this question quite a bit. Is FIPS 140-2 compliant and validated the same thing? They are not the same thing. That's an excellent question. So you want to have components that are validated. Now, the uh, POEM exception that I, I spoke about, we're going to circle back to that in step seven. But you definitely have to have FIPS 140-2 validated not compliant and be careful because vendors are a little bit tricky with the wording of their solutions and may not actually be validated, but saying that they're compliant and kind of fool you with that one. That is very, very good to know. Thank yeah. you. Joy.